Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Evolution of the Invertebrate series. You may have noticed it has been a few weeks since we did one of these, and that's because I've been super busy with work. And these videos, unlike the other ones that I've done recently, require a lot more work on my part, and so it kind of went to the back burner. But we're back, and it's time we finish up the SAR supergroup. If you need a refresher, be sure to check out the previous videos in the series. The link to the playlist is in the description below. So you're probably aware that there's a lot of strange creatures in the deep sea. But this little inconspicuous organism might not immediately strike you as odd. Indeed, you'd probably think it was just a sponge or maybe some kind of coral. However, if you tried to collect it, you'd find that it was far more brittle than sponges or corals, and when you examined it under a microscope, you'd see that there are no differentiated cells. In fact, the entire creature is a single cell, with thousands of nuclei stretched thinly between the crooks and crevices of its carbonate shell. These creatures are the Xenophyphoreans, an enigmatic clade that belong to the Foraminifera, one of the most ancient and speciose members of the Rhizaria. So, what exactly are Rhizarians? Well, unlike the Straminopiles and the Alveolates, which have clear shared characteristics that set them apart from other groups, what we call apomorphies, the Rhizarians don't. In fact, for most of their history, they were thought to be specialized amoeba, but molecular data has since shown that the amoeba are more related to us than they are to the Rhizaria. Despite our difficulties in identifying unifying characteristics outside of shared genetics, Rhizarians are some of the most dazzling protists on the planet. And because most of them build shells of calcium carbonate, they have a rich fossil record and have contributed to some of the most iconic marvels, such as the Cliffs of Dover, which are mostly composed of foraminiferans, as well as the Great Pyramids, the stones of which contain these little protists. Let's talk about some shared general anatomical features before diving into the foraminiferans Manifera and Radiolaria, the two most abundant and recognizable Rhizarians in more detail. Most Rhizarians are amoeboid, and as I stated previously, many form shells called tests. Uh, they can form these tests in different ways. One is via agglutination, which is gluing of particles together. In this way, the tests are generally a mishmash of sand grains, broken shells, and other inorganic material. Others secrete organic, such as chitin, or inorganic material, including calcium carbonate or silicate, to form their shells. In addition, most Rhizarians have filamentous pseudopods. Instead of the large, globular extensions seen in most amoeba, the pseudopods of the Rhizarians are very thin and can form intricate, web-like networks. Phylogenetically, there are two major clades of Rhizaria, the Circozoa and the Retaria. The Circozoans are a diverse group of important soil and freshwater protists that may be amoeboid or flagellated, form a variety of test types, and generally have very few characteristics that link them morphologically. However, their monophyly has been supported by molecular phylogenies of ribosomal DNA. Indeed, they were one of the first groups to be designated solely by molecular phylogenies alone, uh, such, again, because they lack any obvious apomorphies. The Retaria, which include the Foraminifera and the Radiolaria, have a few shared molecular characteristics. One of the most well-known is the appearance of beta-2 tubulin molecules. Tubulins are proteins that are involved in the formation of the pseudopods and so are important and widespread in protists. Many protists have simply beta tubulins, and there was an ancestral duplication of the beta tubulin gene in the lineage leading to the Retaria. The duplicate, called beta 2, has since taken on a new function. It's involved in the assembly of helical filaments, which are unique microtubule intermediates found only in the Retaria. Indeed, this study by Ho et al. in 2013 found that the beta duplicate has evolved under strong positive selection, displaying several amino acid substitutions from the parent gene that has permitted it to acquire this new function. Let's zoom in now and talk about the two groups within the Retaria. The Radiolarians represent the paraphyletic group that has seen significant reshuffling thanks to molecular phylogenetics, but there exist three groups within the Retaria historically classified as Radiolarians. For our purposes, we'll just be talking about the polycysteines as they make up the majority of the Radiolarians. The polycysteines are hollow planktonic protists, which means that they spend their entire life in the water column. While there are some that harbor photosynthetic endosymbionts, most are heterotrophic and feed using their filamentous pseudopods, which trap food particles like a web. 
They build their shells from opaline silica, which can form incredibly elaborate lattices and geometrical shapes uh, that make them one of the most visually stunning protists. They're also incredibly ancient. The first forms appeared during the Cambrian, and due to their exceptional ability to fossilize, they are one of the most common microfossils, appearing in virtually every marine sediment. This has made them ideal organisms for studying ancient climates due to their incredibly simple biogeography. As holoplankton that don't rely on sunlight, species assemblages tend to track temperature. Tropical species are mostly limited to near the equator and in shallow water, while higher latitude species can follow the isotherm. Cold water species are only found near the surface, near the poles, but since the cold water is more dense and due to the direction of polar currents, it is pushed under the hotter tropical waters at lower latitudes. Thus, those same cold water species can be found near the tropics, only at greater depths. So as individuals die, they sink to the bottom, which creates a unique strata of cold water adapted, abyssal species at the bottom, mid-latitude species on top of them, followed by a tropical species at the most shallow level. From this, we can track changes in Earth's temperature across latitudes and through time, as tropical species expand or contract, or, during periods of cooling, are entirely replaced by polar species at similar latitudes. Sister to the polycystine radiolarians are the well-known and hyperdiverse foraminiferans. Foraminifera, which means hole bearers, often build tiny coiled shells that if you didn't know any better, you might think are microscopic snails. But as their name implies, if you look close, you'll see tiny holes in the shell. These are to allow the reticulopods, their stringy pseudopods, to extend and form the vast webs for capturing prey. Unlike holoplankton radiolarians, most forams are benthic, living in the sediment. They may have a single chamber or multiple chambers. The multi-chambered forams are those pictured here, with the coiled structures actually representing each discrete chamber. Furthermore, forams don't live inside of their shell, but rather their shell lives inside of them. That is, it's covered by the protoplasm. Forams have two forms. The gamont, or sexual form, which has a lard proloculus, or first chamber, and the agamont, or asexual form, which has a proportionally much smaller proloculus. The gamont has only a single nucleus, but the asexual gamont may have several. The reproductive mode involves what's called alternation of generations, which is a transition between haploid and diploid generations. The gamete form is haploid and produces undifferentiated biflagellated gametes that fuse to form a diploid zygote that grows into a multinucleated agamont. This form reproduces asexually via meiosis, generating haploid offspring which may differentiate in into either a schizont or another gamont. The schizont merely continues to produce other haploid offspring that may themselves differentiate into schizonts or gamonts. It's important to note that it is only a generalized foram reproductive life cycle uh, and that various extensions exist on this theme. While most are heterotrophic, there exist some that are mixotrophic, which means that they both feed on other organisms as predators, or they may harbor photosynthetic prokaryotes. Some are even parasitic, living on the outside of their host and stealing food from them, or burrowing within them and feeding on their insides. Forams, like the radiolarians, are incredibly important in understanding Earth's past because of their uniquely rich fossil record and life history. Several studies, like the one shown here, have used carbon and, and oxygen isotopes from fossilized foraminiferans to investigate changing ocean chemistry and temperature profiles over time spans of tens of millions of years. One analysis often used is the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 isotopes in the calcium carbonate shells of fossil forams, which is influenced in a predictable way by temperature. Water containing oxygen-18 isotopes is heavier, and therefore tends to precipitate first during condensation. This leads to the interesting pattern that rain in the tropics have greater proportions of oxygen-18 than snow in the Arctic. Thus, differing proportions of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 present in 4M tests in conjunction with the latitudinal distribution of the sediment in which the fossils were collected is informative about, about the past climate. Since they have such diverse shell morphology, they are easily recognized and distinguished, making them excellent indicator fossils, that is, fossils that are uniquely present in layers of known age and type. Indeed, 4Ms are used extensively by the oil industry in this way. You see, for petroleum 
to be generated, you typically need temperatures in sedimentary layers between 60 and 110 degrees Celsius. That is 140 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit for my fellow Americans. This is called the oil window. The oil industry utilizes the Foraminiferal Coloration Index, or FCI, as a measure of burial temperature. The index ranges from 0 to 10 and corresponds to changes in the color of the carbonate shell of the forams from pale white to black. Uh, typically, the oil window corresponds to indexes between 2 and 6, where the forams are light to dark brown. Thus, sediments that were formed at very high temperatures will cause the carbonate in the foram shell to turn dark. These high temperatures are the result of pressure. Remember, the ideal gas law states pressure and temperature are, are directly proportional. Thus, as sediment slowly begins to accumulate, the weight on top of the lower layers increases the pressure, which directly increases the temperature. The temperature at which sediment actually lithified tells us whether or not it was hot enough to be within the oil window, i.e. to change the color of the forams to an FCI of 2 to 6. So today we reviewed in broad strokes the rise area, finishing off the SAR supergroup. We chatted in detail about the paraphyletic radiolaria and the fascinating foraminifera, and how they both have extensively contributed to our understanding of Earth's past geological and climatic history. Next time we'll move on to the Discoba and the Metanomalia. Mata, groups that include some well-known flagellates like euglena, but also some of the most notorious parasites such as Jardia. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.